Last week we started uh, a little bit of a series talking about building the tabernacle and how we need to take the first part of this year and, and build the tabernacle. Um, if, if you remember, we read that on the first day of the first month, so it would be the first day of the year, right? First day of the first month. God instructed Moses to build this tabernacle. So I want to challenge us to take the first part of this year and build the tabernacle, figuratively speaking, of course. Um, so that is to say, let's start 2022 by focusing on building up some things in our lives that will facilitate the true worship of God. And that's what the purpose of the tabernacle was. And so when God told Moses to build the tabernacle, he then gave him specific instructions on exactly how to build it and when to put in certain things. And last week we talked about the first thing that Moses was instructed to do was to place the Ark of the Covenant inside the tabernacle. And of course we know the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. It was the presence of God. So the, the truth that we took from that was that we need to prioritize his presence. We need to prioritize the presence of God and being in his presence. We need to make it our number one priority to spend time in his presence. Amen. Whether we're at home, at work, in the car or at church yeah even even at church sometimes we can get so distracted by you know all the different things we got going on but you know i feel like i've been running around in a bunch of different directions this morning it's easy to get so distracted by the things we have going on that we'll forget to prioritize his presence at church and forget that the reason that we're here is to be in his presence and to worship him Amen. and so i hope you took some steps last week to put this in practice i hope you took some real steps to, to put this into practice in your own life and now we're going to go back to exodus chapter 40 and i want to read in verse 4 and really just the first half of verse 4 here it said the next thing it says is and you shall bring in the table and arrange it you shall bring in the table and arrange it now he says i'm bringing the table and arrange it so there was more to this table than just the table there was more to it and if we skip down to verse 22 this is when Moses actually takes what God told him to do and, and does it. Uh, you'll see that there's a little bit more to this table. So we'll skip down and look at verse 22 here. It says, He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. So the table was just like the ark in that it was made out of acacia wood. It was overlaid with pure gold. It was furniture that was fit for the house of a king which is what it what it was the tabernacle god's house and on top of the table there was laid out what was called the showbread showbread this was uh 12 loaves of, of bread so two stacks of six is what it says and these 12 loaves represented god's everlasting covenant with the 12 tribes of israel it would have been a constant reminder, this table of showbread, of the covenant and of God's mercy and God's provision towards his people. But the bread wasn't just there for the sake of symbolism. It wasn't just there for them to look at. It also served a practical purpose. And if we look over at Leviticus chapter 24, it goes into a little bit more detail. Leviticus 24. I'll give you a second if you want to turn turn there. We'll read a few verses here. Leviticus 24, verse 5 through 9 says, You shall take the fine flour and bake 12 loaves from it, two tenths of an ephah shall be in each loaf, and you shall set them in two piles, six in a pile, and on the table of pure gold before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each pile, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion, as a food offering to the Lord. Has anybody ever ate frankincense on the bread? Could this kind of be what he was talking about? Could, could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I didn't look into that, but it could be, <laughs> have something to do with the tables and then he turned over in the temple. But is it, this part he wants on the now, I don't know anything about, it says you put frankincense on the bread. I don't normally go to Subway and get frankincense on my sandwich. I don't know if y'all do, but I don't know what that tastes like, but it, it must taste okay. It must be edible. They were eating it. 
And it says in verse 8, Every Sabbath day Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual do. So when it says perpetual, it means this is something they were going to do over and over, ongoing. It was a constant reminder of God's covenant and the covenant that he had with his people. And so you see the priests were to eat the bread in the tabernacle. They were to actually to eat this bread. It was to nourish them and help them do the things that they needed to do. Now, what does this all mean to us? This, the table, the bread, all of that. What does it have to do with us? Well, it, it all has to do with fellowship. It all has to do with fellowship. And if we're going to build the tabernacle, we need to understand the value of fellowship. Fellowship. When I was growing up <clears throat> in church, I thought fellowship was, uh, you go out to eat at Shoney's after church is over, and that's, that's fellowship. You know, I, thought, I thought church happened at church and fellowship happened at Shoney's. Amen. Somebody should have said amen right there. And, uh, or Bonanza. But, you know, and that is part of it, just being around other Christians. You could definitely fellowship at Shawnee's um, if it was yeah. still there. <laughs> you have to find one. Uh, but, but, but you can fellowship, you know, outside of, of church. But listen to what it says in Acts 2 and 42. This is the, talking about the early church. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship to breaking of bread and the prayers. They devoted themselves to fellowship. That's interesting because I, I understand if it says they devoted their, themselves to the teaching of the apostles, I, that makes sense to me, you know. I understand if it says they devoted themselves to prayer, of course we want to devote ourselves to prayer. I don't know if you've ever thought about devoting yourself to fellowship, making it something you intentionally seek out and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fellowship with other believers and with God. Yeah. They understood that fellowship was not an optional part of the faith, but it's actually essential to our faith. Fellowship is essential to our faith. And a word that you often hear today, kind of in the place of fellowship sometimes, is community. Community. You know, there's, there's a community for everything. Everything is a, has a community. You know, if there's a community of Star Wars fans that all like Star Wars and there, there's a Star Wars community and you know there's people who love cats and they're the cat lovers community and everything kind of is a, a community just about any little hobby you can think of no matter how small or specific you think it is you could probably go on Facebook and find a group of people who do that same thing and you can join that group and be part of the you know whatever community that is and so some folks might think of that and they might say well I can get this sense of community anywhere I don't need a church for that I can find that you know at my local chess club or, or whatever but it's not true because fellowship is more than just having a sense of community it's more than that and let me give you real quick five ways that Christian fellowship is different than other communities five ways that Christian fellowship is different than other communities number one Number one is we fellowship directly with God. We fellowship directly with God. First John 1 and 3 says it like this. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have fellowship directly with God himself, just like Adam. You know, we read about Adam before the fall how he walked in the garden and, and talked with God in the cool of the day and they had this fellowship this is what Jesus has restored to us through the cross the fellowship with God we have that same thing now we get to do the same thing and that's what this table of, of showbread was about it was you know the priest would come in and they would eat this bread in the presence of God in his house in his house they would go in and enjoy a meal it was fellowship with God so when we come together like this, you know, this morning, we are spiritually nourished together, corporately. We're not only worshiping God, but we're fellowshipping with him. Amen. That's right. <clears throat> Number two, we fellowship in the presence of Jesus. We fellowship in the presence of Jesus. Ultimately, the showbread and the tabernacle, the table and the showbread was a picture of Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. 
And, and it was a picture of him. But I love the words of Jesus in Matthew 18, 20. He says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Amen. Mm, what an incredible promise. And, and, you know, sometimes it's one of those verses we could hear it so often that, you know, it loses its meaning. But that's an incredible promise that we have that if we just gather in his name, he says, I will be there. I'll be there also. It's so simple that, you know, now if he had said where there are at least 100 people in my name, I'll be there. If he had said that, we'd be left out this morning, right? <laughs> but thank God we're not left out because he said Amen. if just two or three people gather in my name, I'll be there with you. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Did you know that a big part of discipleship when Jesus was discipling his disciples a big part of that was the fellowship that they had. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but they spent roughly three and a half years together. Some of that is recorded for us in Scripture, the, the miracles and the, you know, Jesus' teachings. But, you know, there was also times when they were just walking down the road, just talking, talking about the day, just maybe laughing, um, maybe just, just, uh, just spending time together, fellowship together. And fellowship is a big part of discipleship that's why we need to devote ourselves to fellowship with jesus and, and with each other number three fellowship builds us up spiritually now you might go down to the chess club meeting and you might have a lot of fun discussing the strategies of the queen and the, I don't know what they're whatever they do at chess club meetings but you might have a lot of fun there but uh, it's not going to build you up spiritually no matter how much fun you have I mean unless it's a Christian chess club and you're kind of doing it with other Christians but just in, in a secular sense it's not going to build you up spiritually but fellowship builds us up and I'm not talking about preaching and teaching of course we need preaching and teaching but I'm talking about the fellowship of believers it edifies us. That's the word the Bible uses. It edifies us. It builds us spiritually. I was, I've been thinking a lot about Sister Sarah's testimony last week. And uh, it was a powerful testimony. And a few times this week I've thought about it. And it's, and it's encouraged me every time that i thought about it. And, and that's what happens. You know, we come in and we um, maybe we share what God's doing in our life. Or somebody sings a song and then you hear the words. And it's like, man, that's exactly what I needed to hear. That's how fellowship builds us up. That's, That's right. how fellowship builds us up spiritually. And this is, this is what happens when we gather together in fellowship. Number four, we fellowship around the Word of God. Around the Word of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever been out somewhere by yourself and you see something really cool or, or kind of crazy. Um, what's the first thing that you want to do? Sure. You want to tell somebody, right? I remember I was driving home from work when I used to work at the distribution center in Opelika and I would get off at like two in the morning, sometimes three in the morning, because that's just the shift that I work. But uh, I was driving home, of course, there's nobody on the road and nobody awake that I know. Everybody I know is asleep. And I saw a, uh, I guess it was probably a, uh, what do they call it, when a meteor or something comes into the atmosphere, but it makes a big fireball in the sky. You know, it looks real dramatic. And I saw that, you know, as I'm driving down the road, I saw one of those like flash across the sky. And uh, the first thing I want to do is tell somebody, but I'm in the car by myself. Everybody I know is asleep. And so by the time I actually get around telling somebody, it's just kind of like, okay. You know, <laughs> you just can't tell it, you can't describe it to them the way that it, it was. But, uh, but you know, that's, that's kind of a bad feeling when something cool happens and, and you can't share it with anybody. Well, you know, when we are reading the scripture, studying scripture, studying the Bible, um, it's kind of like the same thing can happen. We can Something can jump out at us or uh, you know, something catches our attention and, and we want to share that with somebody. Well, we should share that with somebody. That's part of what you know we should do. It's great to have a personal time of Bible study and Bible reading, but sometimes you read something and the Holy Spirit illuminates something to you in Scripture and you just got to share it with somebody. And if you don't know any other Christians and you don't have a church, then you'll be missing out on an important part of fellowship because our fellowship is centered on the Word of God. That's right. And you can't really share that with somebody who's not a Christian. You can't go down to the chess club and share that with your friends at the chess club who are not Christians. I don't know why I'm caught up on the chess club today, but um, we'll, we'll get past that. 
but we fellowship around the word of God. And, and you know, I, uh, this past Wednesday, I just had such a good time in church and we were studying through the word and people were, were giving their thoughts and making points that I hadn't thought of when I was studying. And we, there was just a back and forth. And I, I just left church Wednesday night just feeling built up, feeling encouraged, feeling, uh, feeling good because of that fellowship that we had around the word of God. Our fellowship is not based on sharing a hobby or a favorite movie or anything like that. Our fellowship is built around our common love and reverence for the word of God. And you know, that connects back to the showbread too. It connects back to the table and the showbread because if you remember when Satan tempted Jesus and told him, why don't you just turn these rocks into bread because he'd been fasting for so long. And what did Jesus say to him? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the word is bread to us and it's good for us to sit down and enjoy that bread together. And the last thing that kind of sets our fellowship apart from other communities is that we fellowship at the communion table. And if you can probably see the stuff here, we're gonna be taking communion here in just a little bit. But, you know, we've been talking about the table in the tabernacle and you know, but today, as interesting as, as it is to read about that and study about that, that's not a table that we can go to today. That's not a place that we can physically go to and, and see that bread and, and eat that bread. It's not there anymore. It's not around anymore. But there is another table that we can go to today. Jesus, as he prepared to go to the cross, sat down with his disciples for a final time of fellowship. And of course, we know that this is where he instructed them to have this time of communion regularly, the Lord's Supper. And we are going to take communion this morning, but I just want to say the communion table is the perfect intersection of our fellowship with God and our fellowship with each other. It's the perfect place where those two things meet. And in fact, in order to take communion, you must be in fellowship with God. It's not for everybody. It's only for those who have a relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. This is not for people who don't know the Lord. This is for us. This is for our fellowship. So before we take communion, what do we do with what we've heard about fellowship today? What should we go out of here and, and, and put into practice in our life? Well, I think what we need to do is just the same as they did in the early church devote ourselves to fellowship commit ourselves to fellowship make it something where we say you know it's just as important as as hearing the word taught as studying the word as prayer devote ourselves to fellowship the same way we would those other things amen i'm gonna have